recording, share my screen. Well, now there's only one. No, nope, I'm the only participant. Um, let's hold off a second. I'm going. There we go. All right, you should see my screen now. Today is May 11th, and we are actually supposed to be starting Chapter 8, but we're not there. We're barely started Chapter 6, so we're behind schedule. Um, there is no lab today. I will be logging in to answer questions for 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, if there's no further questions, I'm going to log off. So in the lab, assuming there's no questions, I will be in the lab only from 6.30 to 6.45. So if you have a question, log in at that time. If you don't have a question, you don't need to log in for the lab. You should be working on your unknown project. <clears throat> I did get that sent out. It was a day late, but I did get it sent out. So you should have the results for the first three tests. So work on your unknown project today. And don't forget your infectious disease paper is due Saturday, May 13th. That's this Saturday at 11.59 p.m. Any questions about any of that? If not, let's move on to chapter six. Let me move that up. Well, it is up all the way. And I have, we were on this slide where we had talked about trace elements and organic growth factors. Like vitamin C is an organic growth factor that humans have to have. Let's talk about oxygen. Oxygen is something that some organisms require to survive. And even the organisms that do not require oxygen, they usually have a oxygen requirement, meaning maybe it has to be, uh, oxygen has to be gone. Or obviously for us, oxygen has to be present. Uh, in a sense, molecular oxygen is a toxic substance, and oxygen gas itself is not the problem, but there are four toxic forms of oxygen where oxygen gets changed, and then there are four toxic forms of oxygen. The first is singlet oxygen, where oxygen gas is boosted to a higher energy level the singlet oxygen is extremely reactive and it is present in phagocytic white blood cells. And then they use the secretion of singlet oxygen to attack other cells. Like when uh, white blood cells are attacking a uh, worm, they will secrete substances, including singlet oxygen. And then these things will destroy cells on the worm. And it is true white blood cells have singlet oxygen, which they do um, use on other cells, including things that they phagosome. And then they use this to attack the cell that they phagosome. There are uh, other fo toxic forms. Like I said, there's four toxic forms. The second is a superoxide free radical. This is oxygen gas that has an extra electron. So it's O2 with a negative charge. That is a highly unstable molecule. And generally this oxygen free radical, whatever it bumps into, it will damage what it bumps into. Uh, Oxygen free radicals are sometimes made in aerobic respiration. But when they bump into another molecule, they generally steal an electron from that molecule. 
So uh, we can neutralize oxygen-free radicals by the enzyme superoxide dismutase, or SOD, and it takes two of the oxygen-free radicals plus two hydrogens, and then makes hydrogen peroxide and oxygen. The oxygen isn't a problem, but actually hydrogen peroxide is toxic to the cells, and the cell has to have a way of neutralizing that hydrogen peroxide. Any question about any of that? I think you've uh, heard that free radicals are not something you want to consume, and uh, oxygen-free radicals are actually one of the worst, but there are other substances which are free radicals, and I think uh, margarine tended to have uh, some free radicals in them, and we'll talk about that. It's when you hydrogenated the uh, the oil, if the hydrogenation wasn't perfect, it would occasionally make a free radical. That's not an oxygen free radical, but it's another free radical that you don't want to consume because free radicals are not good for the cell. Um, I thought I was going to talk about catalase next, but oh, peroxide anions. Uh, peroxide anions are um, oxygen gas with two electrons. And peroxide ions are toxic, but the cell can detoxify them by combining two peroxide ions with two hydrogen ions. That will form oxygen and uh, hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide has to be neutralized and it can be neutralized by two different chemical reactions. Most cells, including our cells, have the enzyme catalase in them, and it can convert hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. There are a few cells like streptococcus, excuse me, here, I'm gonna sneeze. Ah. There are a few cells that have peroxidase around, and it can also take hydrogen peroxide and add it with the two hydrogen ions to make two water molecules. And like I said, streptococcus can survive in the air, growing it, you know, in our normal air, because it has a peroxidase and it can detoxify the hydrogen peroxide, which can be made by either peroxide anions or by uh, superoxide free radicals when you have sod making um, hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide is made in aerobic respiration, but our cells can handle it because our cells have catalase. Any question about any of that? All right, the other uh, fourth and last toxic form of oxygen is a hydroxyl radical. This is an OH group with an extra electron, and it is not the hydroxide ion, which has a negative charge. Um, this hydroxyl radical can bump into another molecule and then steal the electron to make OH negative. An OH uh, free radical or hydroxyl radical is formed by aerobic respiration in trace amounts. It's also formed by ionizing radiation and when hydrogen peroxide reacts with certain metals. This uh, hydroxyl radical is fairly common in cells and our cells have different ways of detoxifying it, mostly with antioxidants. The antioxidant combines with the hydroxyl radical and then neutralizes it. And antioxidants can uh, remove other free radicals as well. Uh, actually, there are two very common antioxidants in our cells which remove hydroxyl radical. 
and that is vitamin C and vitamin E. But also beta carotene is another antioxidant. So obviously everything that is an aerobe has to have some way to remove these four toxic forms of oxygen. Otherwise they wouldn't be an aerobe. So living things have an oxygen requirement and it might be that uh, uh, they require oxygen. All aerobes require oxygen. The electron flows to oxygen in the electron transport chain of aerobic respiration. And then organisms may require the absence of oxygen. And that would be the uh, obligate anaerobes. They require no oxygen around or else they cannot, they cannot grow. The oxygen would kill them. You can classify living things on their oxygen requirement. And we're going to talk about microbes classify on the effect oxygen has on their growth. How you can measure the oxygen effect on their growth is by putting the cells in a thioglycolate tube, a tube containing the media thioglycolate. Thioglycolate removes oxygen from the media. Are there any questions about that? The thioglycolate chemically reacts with oxygen and removes it from the media. Now, when the tube first comes out of the autoclave, it has no oxygen in it. However, there's oxygen in the air and uh, so the oxygen starts moving into the thioglycolate media. At the top of the tube, there will be close to the normal concentration of oxygen, 20 to 21%. But as you go down the tube, you'll get less and less oxygen. Come on, mouse. As you go down the tube, there'll be less and less oxygen because the thioglycolate is reacting with the oxygen, removing it. And at the bottom of the tube, there will be no oxygen. Any question about that? So you inoculate the tube with the microbe. And if the tube only has growth at the top, you know it is an aerobe. And as you go down the tube, there will be less and less growth. And that's sort of shown here, where you have the most growth here, and as you go down the tube, there's less and less growth. And then right here, there's only one dot. And that's because there's only a little bit of oxygen in this place. So the growth is really slow. Down here in the bottom of the tube, there's no growth because there's no oxygen. And aerobes require oxygen or they're not going to grow. Any question about that? Obligate anaerobes will only grow where there is no oxygen. So you'll see their growth only at the bottom of the tube. And as you go up the tube, there will be less and less growth because there will be more and more oxygen. So this isn't quite drawn correctly. There should be a dot right here because a little bit higher than this. There's a little bit of growth. And then above that, there's no growth. Okay. Now, the next easiest one to discuss, or one of the earlier easier ones, are the facultative anaerobes. These organisms prefer growing in full oxygen because they can perform aerobic respiration, but they do not require oxygen to grow. They can switch to some other form to generate ATP, such as anaerobic respiration, or maybe fermentation. The point is they can switch and then continue growing in the absence of oxygen. So when you look at this too, you'll have the most growth at the top because it will have the most oxygen. And oxygen um, 
is the most efficient way to generate ATP so the cells will grow the fastest with complete oxygen. As you go down the tube, which is slightly shown here, uh, there will be less and less growth in the tube, but you will see growth all the way down to the bottom of the tube because the organisms can grow without oxygen. They just won't grow as quickly. Any question about any of that? All right, those are the facultative anaerobes. There are also aerotolerant anaerobes. These organisms do not use oxygen. However, they have all of the enzymes they need to detoxify the toxic oxygen molecules. So they can grow in the presence of oxygen because they have the enzymes to grow in the presence of oxygen, but they don't require it because they don't use oxygen in, a, in their growth. They don't have, they either have fermentation or anaerobic respiration to grow. So their growth is uniform all the way down the tomb. You'll see the same amount of growth, come on mouse, at the top of the tube, in the middle of the tube, and at the bottom of the tube. And then lastly, there are microaerophiles. These organisms are aerobes, so they do require the presence of oxygen to grow, but they don't like full oxygen, meaning oxygen at 20 to 21%. They would like to grow in areas where there is reduced oxygen. Many of the bacteria in your stomach, like uh, Hylobacter pylori, is a microaerophile. It does require oxygen to grow, but it prefers to grow at less than 20%. And this is usually between 2% and 10% for the microaerophiles. And their growth is best in the middle of the thioglycolate tube. As you go down the tube, you'll see less and less growth. And as you go up the tube, you'll see less and less growth. Any question about the microaerophiles? All right. So thioglycolate was one media. Let's talk a little bit more about media. We've talked about general purpose media, and this is media that allows many different organisms to grow. Media is the plural form of the word. Medium is the singular form of the world. So when you're talking about one, you should say the word medium. But if you're talking about two or more, you should say the word media. A media is a liquid or solid solution containing all of the nutrients required for microbial growth. They're usually given to students sterile, meaning they have no living microbes in them. And we usually sterilize them in an autoclave. The inoculum is the microbes that are introduced into the medium for growth. A culture is microbes growing in or on a culture medium. There are a very wide variety of media available for growing microbial growth. If we were in the lab, I could show you a book that's actually a little bigger than this. Probably a little wider too, but you're getting the idea of the size of this. It's a really big book. And on each page of the book, there is one medium. So there's a very large number of pages in this book because it's really thick. And that's just telling you how many different types of media we have to grow microbes in. So media uh, have the 
nutrients required to support microbial growth. They generally have an energy source, a carbon source, a source of nitrogen, a source of sulfur, a source of phosphorus, a source of trace elements, and that may simply come from the water that we add to the media. And if the organism requires it, they may have an organic growth factor. Now, if we're growing a photoautotroph, we don't need an energy source because it's a phototroph. It's an autotroph, so it doesn't need a carbon source. If the organism fixes nitrogen from the air, we may not need a nitrogen source, but we would need a sulfur source and a phosphorus source. And then, like I said, the trace elements usually come from the water. If you're using tap water, you will supply the trace elements. And then a photoautotroph almost never would have an organic growth factor required. So a photoautotroph doesn't have a lot of requirements that need to be added to the medium. Auger is something that we sometimes add to a liquid media to make it a solid. There are different things you can add, but auger is the one we add the most. It's actually a complex polysaccharide derived from seaweed. And we use it to solidify the liquid media. In the auger, we usually have it in either a Petri dish or a tube. And if we have it in the tube, it can be in one of two forms. The tube can be a slant where the auger will be something like that, and then you streak the uh, bacteria on the slant, or the tube can be, oops, sorry. The tube can be a butt, also called the deep, where the auger is going straight across. Auger is generally not metabolized by microbes, why we use it so much in microbiology. Uh, initially, actually, uh, uh, Dr. Koch was trying to make solid medias, and he started with slices of potato, and you can imagine that wasn't a very good surface to grow microbes on. And then he moved to jello, and that was much better the trouble was microbes sometimes digested the jello, and then his uh, petri dish would become liquid, and all the cultures would come together, and and that, and it made a mess, and he didn't like that. And there's actually uh, uh, an assistant, his uh, assistant, meaning uh, I used to know the name of this guy. It was the wife of one of his assistants, and uh, she suggested that he use auger which is a substance that people bake with or cook with to uh, thicken things. And he tried it and it worked very well. And we use auger today. And this comes way back to uh, Dr. Cox's lab. There are different types of culture media. There's a chemically defined media where we know the exact chemical composition of the media meaning we know all the molecules that are added in the media because we added each one of these molecules. And here is a, let me see if I can blow this up. A simple, oops, go back. I'm trying to move that out of the way. A simple defined Chemical media, this is usually called glucose media or glucose salt media. It supplies glucose as its carbon and energy source. It has ammonium phosphate to provide nitrogen as well as phosphate, sodium chloride, uh, magnesium sulfate to provide both sulfate and magnesium, and then potassium phosphate to provide potassium and more phosphate.
So that's the only molecules in this media besides water, assuming we're using distilled water. Uh, many growth factors may be required by organisms that we call fastidious, and this would be a media that you're making that's a chemically defined and is for a fastidious organism. And let me see what we have in there. We have organic growth factors like thymine, a B vitamin, nicotinamide, another B vitamin, uracil, that's a uh, RNA uh, metabolite, etc. Chemically defined media are normally only used in autotrophs because they do not require many additives to be added. The other type of uh, media is a complex media, and it contains extracts and digests of yeast, meat, and plants. These provide vitamins and organic growth factors, but the exact chemical composition of these complex media are not known. Let me blow that up. Come on. Uh, like uh, nutrient agar has peptone, a partially digested protein from soybeans, and then beef extract, three grams added to one liter water, and then sodium chloride and agar. And that's all a nutrient agar is. But the beef is going to be adding a whole bunch of molecules, and it'll be different depending on what the cow had been eating. And so the exact chemical nature of the beef, ex beef extract is we don't know. And different uh, beef extracts, meaning different, what do you call it, batches of beef extract, will even have different molecules in them. Uh, like I said, peptone is a partial protein digest, usually obtained from soybeans. And it does provide a energy source, a carbon source, a nitrogen source, and a sulfur source. And so does the beef extract. We use complex media to grow heterotrophs, bacteria and fungi, that require an organic carbon source. And then, like I said, nutrient agar can grow many organisms, like E. coli, Enterobacter, aerogenes, um, Staphylococcus aureus. But it cannot grow fastidious organisms. Anyway, she, we use the complex media for growing heterotrophs, bacteria that require an organic chemical source. We also have anaerobic media, and this is an important media for growing obligate anaerobes. These organisms would be killed by oxygen. And so you have to keep the organisms, the cells, in the anaerobic media at all times. It usually has a reducing chemical in it, such as sodium thioglycolate, which is what makes up thioglycolate media. And that chemically removes the oxygen from the media, resulting in oxygen depletion, at least at the bottom of the tube. We then have selective media, and this has an additive added to the media that selects against certain microorganisms, but allows other microorganisms to grow. An example is 7% sodium chloride media. Most organisms cannot grow in 7% sodium chloride, like Streptococcus pyogenes, the bacteria that causes strep throat. It would not grow in 7% uh, sodium chloride. But Staphylococcus aureus could grow. And so this is selective. And if we had like two cell streptococcus biogenes and staphylococcus aureus growing together and you wanted to separate it out and only work with the staphylococcus aureus you could put it in seven percent sodium chloride media and only the staphylococcus aureus would grow 
There's also differential media, and this media provides differences between different types of uh, species or organisms. The differences are not related to how well the organisms grow on the media. It oftentimes makes it easy to distinguish colonies of different microorganisms, like they can have different colors. They can also do different things to the media, like one differential media is blood auger, and it allows us to differentiate between the type of hemolytic activity that occurs by the cells. You can have uh, gamma hemolysis where there is no hemolysis. You can have alpha hemolysis where there's partial hemolysis. And then you can have beta hemolysis where there's complete hemolysis. And so this B or the beta is uh, the white is the growth of the cells and they're creating this clear zone around the cells. And that's from beta hemolysis, where all the red blood cells are lysed. You can actually see through the media in this clear zone. And then further out, we have the redness of the blood. Alpha hemolysis, the white or off-white, is the bacteria. And then the dark ring around the bacteria which is easily seen inside the alpha, that's from the partial hemolysis of the red blood cells. It makes the media look either dark or sometimes greenish. And then the no hemolysis or gamma hemolysis, you can see the red blood cells come right up to the cells where they're growing on the blood. Any questions about differential media. Now you can combine the different media, like there are selective and differential media, like EMB, eosine methylene B, it's selective against gram-positive bacteria. So gram-positive bacteria tend not to grow on EMB. And that means gram-negatives can grow on EMB, and it's differential on the basis of lactose fermentation. Um, let me blow this up. These cells look greenish or blackish, and that's because they're fermenting the sugar lactose. And if the bacteria can grow on the plate, meaning it's a gram negative, but it does not ferment the sugar lactose, the cells will be its normal color. And in this case, the cells are white. Any question about any of that? All right. There is also an enrichment media. And this media encourages the growth of certain microorganisms to grow. So by definition, it is also selective. The only difference is an enrichment media is used specifically to enrich for the cells of interest. But it is selective. So it increases the numbers of desired microorganisms to a detectable level. So let's say that we're looking at cells from the soil. And there's going to be thousands of different types of microbes in the soil. And we're looking for one that specifically metabolizes phenol. Well, we could put it in an enrichment media and enrich for the presence of phenol degrading organisms. One way to do that is to have an enrichment media where the only chemical and uh, energy source, as well as the only carbon source, comes from phenol in the media. And then the phenol degrading organisms would grow. And that would enrich for phenol degrading bacteria. 
what you do is you just transfer the cells into the phenol media. And then once the cells grow up, you can then take an aliquot out of that and put it into another phenol media, it's just the same tube, uh, just a new tube. And that then that uh, further enriches for phenol degrading microbes. And so if you had the presence of phenol degrading microbes at one cell and 10 to the six cells, and you grow it in the phenol enriching media one time, you might enrich by a hundred fold. And so you do that again, and that it only enrich it to one times 10 to the fourth, which would not be doable to streak out. But if you were to do it again, and that would reduce it to one cell in a hundred, would be a phenol degrading bacteria. And if you streaked out enough colonies, you would get a colony that was uh, phenol degrading. Generally, you want to increase it up to about 10% of the cells being what you're looking for. And then when you streak it out, you would be able to find one colony in 10, which is the colony of interest. All right, this slide is showing you a uh, summary of the different types of media. I'm gonna skip over it because we're behind schedule. Let me briefly say that a pure culture is a culture that contains only one species. A colony is a population of cells arising from a single cell or a spore or a two cells stuck together or a clump of cells stuck together. Because of the presence of two or more cells that can give rise to a colony, when we streak out a plate for colony isolation, when you obtain cells from one colony, only about 70% of those colonies will be a pure culture. About 30% will not be a pure culture, meaning they'll be um, started by two or more cells. And so what you do is you streak it out again meaning you streak it out the first time, get isolated colonies, take one colony, streak it out again for colony isolation, and then take your cells from one colony that's gone through two colony forming events, and then that increases the chance that the cells are pure by over 95% of the time. And that's what we do in microbiology to get a pure culture. Uh, because colonies can be formed by more than one cells, when we count the colonies, we don't say that the presence of cells are so many per mil. We say the presence of colony forming units per mil. All right, any question about any of that? So this is taking a look at Streaking for colony isolation. Let me just go through that one more time. What you do is you take your sample, streak it out, sterilize the loop, streak it out. You shouldn't go all the way back here. What you should do is where it's more dilute. So come in here and you want to come about three times, three or four times, picking up cells to make your second um, streak. And then sterilize your loop. And this one looks like it's done correctly. Uh, where they've, they've done it going about three times in. Um, and they're not going way up here. They're going over here. Uh, that shouldn't be there. That should be right to there. And then they make the third quadrant and you're getting isolated cells someplace along the line. You could get it if you have a very uh, dilute slim solution of cells. You could get it in this region of quadrant one, or you could get it in quadrant two, and it looks like we're starting to get isolated uh, 
colonies in quadrant two. And then, of course, we get isolated colonies in quadrant three. So let's talk a little bit about how bacteria grow. Bacteria grow generally by three different means. Most bacteria grow by binary fission, and that's simply the cell, one cell splits into two. A few bacteria grow by budding, where they put an outgrowth on the parent cell that we call a bud, and then that bud enlarges. And it doesn't separate from the parent cell until the bud is almost the same size as the parent cell. And then there are a few bacteria species that grow by reproductive spores. One parent cell will make several spores, and that is reproduction. And let me go ahead and draw that. Usually we have a parent bacteria cell. I think I got it already. And it'll, uh, come on, my mouse isn't working well. It'll go up like that and then it'll make spores at the tip of the cell. These spores will be small. And then the spores, there's usually only a few of them. There aren't, you know, like 20 of them. There's usually less than a dozen. It's usually three to something like six of them. And then these spores can go elsewhere and then germinate and then form their own parent cell, which when it'll grow, it'll go like that. Usually the spores are put on the edge of the cell, and part of the reason for the edge is that the edge is more likely for the spore to go elsewhere. Like if an animal comes by, it can brush up on this and then carry that spore elsewhere. The wind can carry that spore elsewhere. Any question about spores? The point is a reproductive spore is reproduction because one, the parent cell is one cell. And then at the end, after we make the reproductive cells, we have five cells. That is reproduction. And the parent cell typically does not die. So one cell will make five cells. And that is reproduction. When we're talking about endospores, as you remember, an endospore, we have one cell and it'll form the endospore within it. And then the parent cell will die because the, the environment's deteriorating. That's why you make the endospore. And then the endospore will survive. It'll usually come out of the cell and then just wait for a favorable environment and then it will germinate. So an endospore is one cell makes one cell. That's not reproduction. Let me go through budding. Well, actually, let me go through binary fission. In binary fission, you have one cell, and it'll replicate the nucleus, two copies of the chromosome. One copy will move to one side of the cell. The other copy will move to the other side of the cell. And then the cell will literally split into two. It'll form a cell wall and a cell membrane in between the cell. And there you can see an actual electron microscopic image of a cell going through binary fission. And that is both the cell wall. Boy, I'm gonna sneeze again, sorry. That is both the cell wall and the cell membrane, which is being formed in between the two nuclei. And then one cell will form two cells, and the two cells will separate. That's um, binary fission. Let's talk about budding. 
Budding is something that I'm going to show you that happens in yeast. Oh, where is it? There it is. Where one parent cell puts out a bud. Ah, oh, crud. And then that bud grows. So we'll look at this cell here. And you can see it's starting to put out a bud right there. The bud has been growing. Right there. Take a look at this right there. That's the DNA molecule. Let's back up just a little bit. Let me see if I can make this a little bigger. I don't know how to do that. Oh, there we go. Back up just a little more. There we go. There, the DNA is uh, replicating. And right there, the DNA is moving into the bud. The bud is enlarging. The cells are still connected. And right now, the cell is broken off. The bud is broken off. It's an independent cell. And then this cell is starting to form a bud over there. And this cell will start to form a bud over here. Any questions about budding? Budding is reproduction. Some bacteria can go through budding. Most go through binary fission to reproduce. When we're talking about cellular growth, it's important to understand the concept of the generation time. The generation time is the time required for one cell to divide and become two. That generation time is the same for the population whatever its number is, let's say 1 million, for the population to double. So 1 million to go to 2 million. That is the same generation time as one cell to split and go into two cells. Now, when we're talking about the generation time, it's important to realize that it is the time it takes per generation. So don't get the generation time confused with our sp speed limit, which would be 60 miles per hour. The generation time is not the number of generations per hour. It is the number of uh, time, minutes, per generation. Is that clear to everyone? Now, usually when we talk about the generation time, we can say E. coli, which is one of the fastest cells to grow, has a generation time of 20 minutes. When we say it that way, we mean that the generation time is 20 minutes per generation. So we leave off the per generation because it's understood. And although some bacteria can be as quick as E. coli, where their generation time is 20 minutes, most bacteria have a generation between one and three hours, meaning they will double between one and three hours. Now, the mycobacterium are slower. Microbacterium leprae, the bacteria that causes leprosy, is the slowest bacteria I know of, and its generation time is 10 days. The mycobacterium are slower than most other bacteria because they have to make mycolic acid, a very complex substance, and then they put that mycolic acid in their cell wall. Any question about any of that? 
when we're talking about the generation time or the number of cells growing over time, we usually use a semi-log plot shown here where the number of cells on the y-axis is a log number of cells. Then the generation is the arithmetic scale, so it's a normal scale. If we were to have the number of cells in the arithmetic scale, the normal scale, then the plot of the cells would look like this, exponential. And you'll notice that one cell divides into two, two cells into four, four cells into eight cells, eight cells into 16, 16 cells into 32, meaning that most of the points are all stuck together in this area of the graph. Furthermore, on a normal scale, if we were to get the next point, it would be on the ceiling. It would be impossible to put it on this graph. And that is two of the reasons why we do not like to use a normal arithmetic scale when uh, diagramming the growth of the cells. And then the third reason is that when we discuss the growth equation, this is a very complex curve. Something like y equals mx plus nx squared plus at least b, there might be a bx on there too. Whereas when we use the log scale, the points down here get spread out. They're not all bunched together. And then the next point on the graph will be about here. So you could extend this graph and get this point on it. And then the third reason is, is that this equation is very simple. It's just a straight line, y equals mx plus b. And in the old days, when they did things by hand, this equation really simplified uh, the mathematics. Of course, nowadays you can use a calculator or a computer to get this curve here. But the point is, is that the using a semi-log plot gives us a number of advantages. We don't have all the points all together down here where you can't distinguish the points. They're spread out. And then you can put another point on the graph. It will go about here. And this one, like I said, it'll be someplace on the ceiling here. And then the equation is much simpler to work with. That's even if you're only using a a uh, calculator. Oh, there we go. When we're talking about uh, the phases of growth, bacterial growth curves typically have a the same pattern for each growth curve, meaning all growth curves of bacteria typically have this shape. And actually, most living life forms will have this shape in their growth curve. Somebody introduced a bunch of deer to an island. I think it was in the east coast of the United States. And the deer initially had a log phase. And then they had an exponential phase. Then they had a stationary phase. And then the deer ate up most of their food. So there was a death or a decline phase. And bacteria have this same shape of a curve. Initially, when you move bacteria from a solid media to a liquid media, there will be an initial lag phase. In the lag phase, the bacteria are making the enzymes they need to reproduce in the new environment. And the lag phase lasts from when you first inoculate the cells into the media to the point where the cells begin dividing. So the cells are not dividing in the lag phase. No increase in numbers. And then they start dividing. We call that the log or the exponential growth phase. 
and the cells grow exponentially because initially there's very few cells, lots of room for the cells to grow in. And then there's uh, lots of nutrients and very little, if any, waste products at the beginning. As the cells grow, they will begin deteriorating the environment. And as we can see, the growth curve slows, starts bending, meaning it's no longer exponential. The growth curve starts to slow. And that's from the fact that there's less space for the cells to grow. There's less nutrients around. And there are more waste products around. And all of those will slow the growth of the cells. Eventually, the growth will slow to the point where we'll reach the population will be stationary. The numbers will not increase, but they're not decreasing. We call that the stationary phase. In the stationary phase, the lucky cells are growing. So some cells are growing, but for every cell that's growing, there's an unlucky cell and it is dying. The lucky cells have some space around so that they can uh, grow and occupy the space. They have some nutrients around so that they can find the nutrients and grow. And they don't have large numbers of waste products around them so that they can grow. The unlucky cell has either little or no space around them to grow, little or no nutrients around them, so they die. And then they have lots of waste products around them. The important part is in the stationary phase, some cells are growing and other cells are dying. Eventually, the stationary phase ends and we enter the death or decline phase where the population number decreases. Initially, in the death or decline phase, there are some very lucky cells, a small minority that are growing, but there's more cells that are dying and they're dying because there's not very much room for the cells to grow in. There's not very much nutrients for the cells to grow and there's lots of waste products around. Late in the uh, decline phase, there are no cells growing. All the cells are, are essentially dying late in the decline phase. How long the decline phase will last will depend on what characteristic the cells have. For something like E. coli, which isn't terribly hardy, the death or decline phase may last a week or two at most, at least in normal environments. Okay? But if the, the, uh, the species makes endospores, this decline phase can last for years, millennia, maybe even centuries. Any question about any of that? All right. There are different ways we have for measuring microbial growth. There are direct methods for measuring the microbial growth, and there are indirect methods. The direct methods include the plate count, also called the viable plate count, filtration, most probable number, and the direct microscopic count. An indirect method measures the growth indirectly, and that can be by turbidity, metabolic activity, or by measuring the dry weight. I've used all of the methods for estimating the number of cells growing, except for the most probable number means. I've never used that one, but I've actually used all the others. The plate count is the most common method used in microbiology for assaying the counts of cells. 
Uh, this measures the actual numbers of cells that are growing, and we only count the viable cells. We do not count the dead cells. And that's because we plate the cells on a Petri dish, and then the viable cells grow and form a colony. The dead cells do not, and when, then we count the colonies. The disadvantages, this one takes 24 or more hours for the cells to form colonies. And the results are usually not reported as cells per mil because we're having colonies forming. So we say colony forming units per mil. Usually when we do the plate count, we make a serial dilution where we take our original sample, dilute it, again, one to 10, and then take an aliquot of that dilution, make another dilution, one to 10 again, that's one to 100, take one mil of that, put it into nine mils, then we have our one to 1,000, one to 10,000, one to 100,000, and then we plate all of these dilutions onto a Petri dish, a different Petri dish, and there's two ways of doing that. You can use the pour plate or the spread plate. But the point is you put the cells around and then you incubate the plate and then the isolated colony forming units will form isolated colonies. You count the colonies and then you get the number of colony forming units per mil. And then you take that dilution to get the number of cells. For example, this one looks like it's uh, dilution one to 100,000, and we have one, two, three, four, five different cells. So you'd say five colony forming units per mil times the dilution of one to one to 100,000. And that means that the number of cells here in the original aliquot is five times 100,000 colony forming units per mil. Any question about any of that? Now, some of the plates will be way too many colonies to count. Even this one is too many to count. And then others will give you countable colony numbers. Generally, we want a plate between 25 and 250 colonies on the plate. Anything less than 25, we do not use that plate. And the reason for that is if we have 30 cells, oh, let me blow that up. Thirty cells, and we say plus or minus. I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, I can underline it. Plus or minus. Where's my underline? There it is. Plus or minus one. Crap! Oh, come on. Ah. Uh, I'm not seeing that. Well, I still didn't do that well. Uh, that means we have a plus or minus something like, is it 3.3%? I'm just going to do an arrow here. On the other hand, if we only have three colonies and we go plus or minus, I'm, not, oh, crud. I'm just going to go plus or minus this way to make it a little easier. Plus or minus one. That is, uh, uh, mean is going to be three plus or minus 
is that 25? No, 33 percent. Which this plus or minus one, 33 percent is just too great of a number. And that makes this mean um, not very good. Whereas this mean is much better statistically because uh, plus or minus one is only plus or minus 3.3 percent. Any question about that? Oops, didn't mean to do that. Let me do that again. This is what I meant to do. That's why we use this plate and not that plate. You want to use a plate where the mean number of cells is someplace between oh, 25 and 250. You don't want to take it less than 25. Filtration is when you have a dilute sample. And so you'd have a hard time getting the sample to grow on a viable plate count. What you do is you put the cells through a filter and then you plate the filter on top of the plate and then you allow the colonies to grow. So like I said, uh, uh, you use filtration when the presence of bacteria are very low in number, such as when you're assaying the bacteria in normal drinking water. The number is not very great. So you pass it through a filter and then you can get your colony forming units per mil, which would be very low because we passed it through the filter. A direct microscopic count is where you're actually counting the cells under a microscope. What you do is you take an aliquot and then put it under a gridded slide. The volume under this region of the slide is a specific volume. And usually this is designed so that the count in this square here would be one millionth the number of cells per mil. So what this number is, let's say it's about 15 to 20, and let's just say 17, and we'll say the number of colony forming units, or actually the number of cells in this case, per mil in the original sample would be 17 times a million cells per mil. The advantage of this method is it's fairly quick. You just take the aliquot, put it on the slide, make your count. The disadvantage is this is a little bit of uh, eye work and trouble for the person actually doing the count. And then another disadvantage is you don't know, is this cell a live cell or a dead cell? There's no way to know by looking. And so you're counting live cells and dead cells but it is giving you the total number of cells living and dead per mil. Another possible disadvantage is if the cells move about, uh, this one could move up there, that one could move up there. And so you now have less to count. And then these could move over here. So it doesn't work well if the cells are multile. All right, that's the direct methods that I'm going to describe. I'm not going to describe the most probable number because I've never done that method. So I won't test you on it. The indirect methods are turbidity, metabolic activity, and then the dry weight. Uh, turbidity is a very easy and probably the easiest and quickest way to get an estimate of the number of cells. You just put the media in a tube, and then measure the amount of light that gets through the media in a turbidity meter. And then you compare the tube containing the cells in it. And if there's a cell, you can see the cells are going to block the light getting through the media. And then you compare this reading to that reading. 
and you have to have a chart where somebody's looked at the chart, but you can just look at the chart for what this reading is, and it'll tell you how many cells per mil this reading is. Like I said, somebody has to set up the chart, but once you have the chart, you then can very quickly get the number of cells per mil just by putting it in the turbidity meter. Any questions about any of that? All right. Metabolic activity assumes that a bacterial metabolic product like acid produced or CO2 accumulating will be in direct proportion to the number of bacteria present. And this is almost always the case where if there is more CO2 produced, it's because there are more cells. More cells make more CO2. And you just measure that metabolic activity and then compare it to a chart. And then that tells you how many cells per mil you have. Any question about any of that? Now, admittedly, somebody has to go up and make the chart. But once you have the chart, you can just measure the amount of CO2 and then look at the chart and determine how many cells you have. Dry weight is uh, a method you can do where you simply grow up your cells in a liquid culture, centrifuge them down, pour off the liquid, keep the cells, you dry the cells, and then at your leisure, you weigh the cells. The more weight you have, the more cells you have. And so you can determine how many cells you have depending on what, how much weight you have. <clears throat> Any question about that? All right, so all of these methods, the dry weight, the metabolic activity, well, wait a minute, what about that one? Let me say the dry weight, the turbidity meter, the direct microscopic count, and maybe the most probable number are all counting live and dead cells. The viable plate count is only counting viable cells. Any questions about any of that? All right. So those are the different methods we have for uh, measuring the number of cells that are microbes. Any questions about any of this? If not, let me go ahead and start chapter seven, and I'll probably only get the first slide in. Chapter seven is looking at my, the control of microbial growth. Actually, we're not supposed to do that one. That's late in the term. Sorry, it's not chapter seven. What chapter are we on? Chapter eight. I do chapter eight at the end because it's a very easy chapter. Uh, chapter eight is looking at genetics. We'll talk about microbial genetics. You should know the terms of this lesson. What's a genome? What's a gene? Genotype, phenotype. What is vertical and horizontal gene transfer? What's an operon? What is a promoter, an operator? What's a structural gene? And what is crossing over, transformation, conjugation, and transduction? And then two, be able to describe what is DNA replication, RNA transcription, and protein translation. And then lastly, be under be able to understand the different types of mutations. Any questions about what we're gonna talk about? So first, we're gonna talk about the structure and function of the genetic material. 
We'll talk about the flow of genetic information. We'll talk about DNA replication, move on to RNA transcription, and then end with protein translation. Later in the lesson, we'll talk about the regulation of a bacterial gene expression and how gene expression uses operons. We'll talk what about what an operon is and what it entails. We'll move on to mutations and then uh, talk about genetic transfer and recombination. And then at the very end, we'll briefly talk about genes and evolution. All right, any question about that? Uh, genetics is simply the study of what genes are, how they carry information, and how that information is expressed. I guess it's also how genes are replicated. A gene is simply a segment of DNA that encodes a functional product. Usually a gene does encode a protein, but there are some genes that only encode RNA. For example, the rRNA genes only make RNA. They do not make protein. And here we're looking at a chromosome, different locations on the chromosome. And there, let me blow that up. There's a chromosome and we string it out having the DNA running around. And you can see we have one gene there and then another gene there. This kind of looks like the X chromosome. And you'll note there's some region of the DNA that does not code for anything. Any questions about any of that? All right, if there's no questions there, I'm gonna end this lesson here. And I will see you in the lab if you have a question from 6.30 to 6.45. I will be there after 6.45. Assuming there aren't questions, I'm gonna log off. All right, see you.